the most thorough study of this puts the estimate at somewhere between, I think it's 660 and 880,000 children under five who died uh, as a consequence of the sanctions. And remember, that's just children under five because those are more easily measurable uh, by epidemiologists. But that would include um, an unmeasurable number of persons over five, of the elderly, of the sick, um, and that would be in addition to this uh, somewhere between half and three quarters of a million children under five. And how was it that the United States uh, were able, along with Britain and the rest of the Security Council, were able to keep these sanctions in place? They became quickly became unpopular in the face of the uh, the, the effect they were having on Iraq. How were, how was it? Uh, how were they able to keep it in place? And what specific? items were banned from uh, being imported to Iraq? Um, they were kept in place and they were maintained at such an extreme draconian level by a couple of different mechanisms. First, for Iraq to have permission, have an ex uh, a humanitarian exemption to import any single item other than food and medicine initially, there was a committee of the Security Council, the 661 committee, and it operated by consensus. So it, you had to have consensus, the agreement of every single member of the Security Council for every single uh, humanitarian exemption. Uh, in effect, the U.S., uh, it, for the first few years, a few countries uh, banned goods, but really after the mid-90s, it was almost entirely the U.S. About 95 percent of the denials of goods were on the U.S. side. The other maybe 5 percent were um, were British, but it was overwhelmingly U.S. unilateral action. Even the British did not join the U.S. in this. And the U.S. unilaterally blocked essentially everything Iraq needed for its infrastructure, uh, electrical generators, um, food processing equipment, telephone systems. Um, the U.S. used as its criterion dual use, but then if you look literally at the term dual use, and you say, well, what are all the things that a civilian economy uses that a military also uses? The answer is everything, everything. Electrical generators, uh, cars, tires, plywood, glass, glue, all of those things are things that the military uses. All of those things are um, also things that any normal civilian society uses. The U.S. took the position that all infrastructure was dual use and on that basis blocked all infrastructure with virtually no exceptions for over a decade. And that was really what was profoundly damaging. It wasn't just the absurd things that the U.S. blocked, of which there were many, uh, yogurt making equipment, dental equipment. Um, at one point, someone from the Pentagon uh, came before the 661 committee with a vial of cat litter and he said this can be used to stabilize anthrax, suggesting on that grounds that uh, the 661 committee should be blocking everything up to and including cat litter. Uh, so there was at one point someone within the U.S. Uh, this, this process of deciding what items to block or not. He was overruled but he argued that Iraq should not be permitted to import eggs on the grounds that the yolks of the eggs could be used as a medium in which to grow viruses which in turn could be used to produce uh, biological weapons. So that was the ver that was very typical of, of the reasoning on the U.S. side. But the real damage was the infrastructure. Um, the U.S., for example, finally allowed Iraq to import a, a sewage treatment plant which was desperately needed. Uh, 300,000 tons a day of untreated sewage were going to, into Iraq's rivers, um, causing uh, epidemics, again, of waterborne diseases, triggering increases in child mortality from dysentery. So the U.S. finally agreed that Iraq could import uh, a sewage treatment plant, but then blocked the electrical generator needed to run it on the grounds that an electrical generator was something that the military might be able to use and therefore, to be, uh, in some sense, on the safe side, it was prohibited as well. Uh, and, and if you do that, if you cripple the infrastructure of a country, 
uh, that's, that's a death sentence on a massive scale. And that's exactly why you would have uh, half a million, three quarters of a million young children um, dead as a result, um, along with a general public health catastrophe. Uh, Seventy percent of Iraqi women were anemic. Uh, Thirty percent of Iraqi children were malnourished, and on and on and on. And Joy Gordon, finally, uh, put this all in context of the situation in Iraq right now. Uh, after 13 years of sanctions, the war was launched uh, following by the U.S. invasion and occupation. How did the sanctions play a part in uh, determining Iraq's fate uh, in 2010? Well, uh, Nir Rosen was talking about how Iraq has been reduced to a pre-industrial country. Um, but I think we saw that already the case. We saw exactly a lost generation. Um, there was uh, a delegation of uh, staffers, of congressional staffers, who went to Iraq in, uh, I think it was August of 2000. And they wrote a report, which they circulated widely throughout Congress. And in it, they had a quote from the head of UNICEF, who they had met with when they were there. And she said, um, if the sanctions are not lifted, the sanctions are resulting in such a profound isolation, such a profound collapse of education, of, uh, uh, of any kind of uh, the possibility of equipping and training an entire generation to be, um, to be competent, to have... Uh, a sense of themselves in the world, to have any sense of, of a future. She said, there will be a generation or more than a generation that will not be able to recover from this, and that will be very dangerous. That quote was included in a report that was circulated to nearly every member of Congress in the year 2000. So none of this is a surprise. Uh, it was documented uh, constantly throughout the 90s beginning quite literally in March of 1991. Um, it was, this information was completely well known within the Security Council, uh, and, with the, and, and it was documented by the most reputable NGOs in the world, by UN agencies, constantly. Everyone knew that Iraq was collapsing. Everyone knew that uh, there would be a lost generation, that there would not be the means to sustain um, the fundamental conditions of life needed for just a decent human life. We're going to have to leave it there. Joy Gordon is a professor of philosophy at Fairfield University, author of Invisible War, the United States and the Iraq Sanctions. When we come back, we'll look at the talks happening right now in Washington between the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli government. Stay with us.